Hello again and welcome. In this part we're going to cover the um, period of the judges. Uh, so this is part five of our exploration of the Old Testament. The period of judges is a very messy period. The children of Israel, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, are finally entering into the promised land. It's messy because some of the uh, land is taken by conquest, like Jericho, but there's also more assimilation where they just seem to uh, melt into the people and though remaining different, they actually begin to follow the same lifestyles. And as we shall see, therein lies a lot of their problems. The unity under Joshua is very hard to maintain. The world around is in turmoil, and that's good because it allows them uh, in in a way that perhaps they couldn't have done otherwise. But that loose connection of tribes is rallied at sometimes successfully when one of the tribes is threatened, but at other times it doesn't seem to work very well at all. And, and we'll see as we go through the book of Judges how um, it begins to feel to the people like it's not working. But more of that when we get into the situation. But the fact that it holds together is a miracle. And they will put it down, as I would too, to Yahweh, God's grace to them that despite all the mistakes and all the sin God still is leading them and when you think about it from that period looking back towards Abraham is nearly a thousand years so we've covered a great period in history if you think about much of the western world how we've changed say Britain as a nation from William the Conqueror up to the present day. So we'll enter the promised land with the children of Israel and uh, we will see how they get on. So without any more ado, let's begin. Thank you. In part five, we explore Israel's settlement of, into Canaan uh, covered in the book of Judges and Ruth. The timeline for Judges covers the period 1200 to 1020 BC. So if my uh, arithmetic is correct, something around about 180 years. Begins with their settlement in Canaan and ends with um, the demand for a king. In between, we have major judges like Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, and quite a number of minor judges. But all together, they cover this period of settlement. In chapter one, there are the early victories, such as the Battle of Jericho. In chapter two, uh, we have the death of jo Joshua and the early warnings of disobedience while Joshua was alive. And the, then it says that uh, people followed the Lord, but then they turned away. It wasn't a total conquest. There was much assimilation, and there's a list of the nations that have been unconquered. And at that point, there was the call for someone to lead. And so we have the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud and Shamgar. By chapter four and five, we're on to more famous judges. Deborah, who was a prophetess, and Barak, who worked together. And then came Gideon and Gideon again 
uh, was called and was very successful in leading the children of Israel in battle. After Gideon's death, his son Abimelech uh, thinks he can be the successor. And uh, Abimelech is uh, an illegitimate son of Gideon. And he tries to take over control. Uh, it doesn't turn out well. Between chapters 10 and 12, uh, we have um, a few more judges who seem to be there in times of settled um, when there wasn't much war going on. The only one of mention there is Jephthah, and we know more about him because of his daughter, Jephthah's daughter, made famous by the oratorio of Handel. Um, a sad story. Uh, we're not sure who Jephthah was. Uh, and then we have Samson. Again, we're not sure who Samson was. Uh, he seems to be an Israelite, but he certainly doesn't uh, uh, seem to... Uh, obey God's commandments, uh, but um, he, in the end, brings a great victory through his own death. And then we have uh, Micah and the tribe of Dan. A terrible thing occurs um, in the tribe of Dan, and uh, there is an uprising amongst the tribes uh, because of what happened to the Levite concubine. And then there becomes an internecine war between Israel and Dan. So the tribes are fighting together here. Things are getting pretty bad. One tribe refuses to um, take part and they are at the end in chapter 21, they are thrown out of the tribal league. But more about what this tribal league was uh, as we move through this uh, series. It's important to see what the world situation was. If you look at the map, you've got Egypt at the bottom, a big empire. And at the top, you've got the Hittite Empire and you've got Persia, uh, which is uh, Assyria, Babylonia. Egypt at this time had got very weak. When Egypt was strong, they ruled Canaan through a series of vassal kings um, who were city states. But what, and they pay tribute to Egypt. But once um, Egypt became weak, and it did around this time, then these vassal states started to act independently and Egypt could seem to be able to do nothing about it. The other empires in the north were still uh, young and uh, flexing their muscles, but not yet able to uh, conquer anybody else's territory. If you put into that mix, there was a great influx of um, people from um, parts of the Mediterranean, often called the Sea People, because they seem to have arrived on the coast of Canaan by sea. And they settled there. Uh, the uh, most perhaps prominent that everybody knows about are the Philistines. Now the period in archaeological history that we're talking about is the Iron Age and it seems that the Philistines were great um, iron workers. They had chariots um, which of course can only operate on, on, on a coastal plain but they were uh, so powerful that the Israelites struggled to even make any inroads. And as we move on into further parts of this Old Testament series, we'll see how particularly the Philistines became a real thorn in the flesh to the Israelites, who were more or less uh, really um, in the hilly areas. And all these factors caused a vacuum which the Israelites were able to exploit. And you would say this was God's timing they uh, God uh, allowed this to happen at a time when it was possible for them to settle in the land. Now to say a little bit about the Canaanite gods, and I don't want to say too much, uh, the people who were settled in the land were either living in towns or they were agricultural and agricultural workers of course rely heavily on the seasons, on rainfall, 
um, so that they can actually grow enough food to be able to uh, live and survive. And so all over the world uh, grew up uh, uh, fertility cults and around the, the Mediterranean was the cult of Baal and the Canaanites particularly worshipped Baal. These were highly sexual uh, ceremonies uh, to bring fertility to the area um, and of course you could see both from a, a farming point of view and from a, um, <laughs> the point of view of uh, free sex this was something that attracted many Israelites um, and caused God uh, great anger because of course the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me it's also the cult of Ashtati or Asherah and this again was a fertility deity it seemed to change depending on which nation you're talking about there was the cult of Moloch and that was a really evil and dark um, cult and again as we move through we'll see uh, how uh, how that affected uh, so much of what happened in the future to the people of Israel. Now the Tribal League, um, the Tribal League was a loose uh, affiliation of the tribes. The focus of that affiliation was worship of Yahweh and uh, the uh, covenant which was renewed in Joshua chapter 24 before as they were entering into the promised land. The tribal league relied heavily on agreement between the leaders of the tribes. Um, there was no specific leader because Yahweh was their leader and each year they would meet at um, after a covenant renewal ceremony, the shrine uh, moved uh, as the ark uh, and the tent of meeting moved to Shechem and uh, where it remained until King David moved it eventually to Jerusalem and Jerusalem became the focus as it was in New Testament times. As is clear from the reading of Judges, tribal allegiance to the League and each other was far from perfect. As time went on, it began to fragment, tribes refusing to help each other. And indeed, at the end, the tribe of Benjamin being rejected from the League. Um, and you read that chapter 19 onwards. Um, so the tribal League worked for a time, but didn't seem to bring stability to the people of Israel. So who were these judges? Well, there isn't really a common thread except they were those who had the spirit of the Lord on them. So there was, it was a charismatic leadership. A leader seemed to rise from the ranks in time of great need. When times were quiet, and sometimes there was long periods of peace and stability, then um, there were minor uh, judges. But when times were hard, then there were uh, uh, these charismatic leaders uh, were given the spirit of the Lord. And here in Judges 3, 7 to 11, we have a really good, uh, concise description of what uh, of what was happening and how the judges came about. Good judge, there were battles and then there was peace in the land. Offered in a piece of music there's a theme and there are variations and we've got two themes going through the book of Judges. Um, and these themes occur frequently, one at the beginning of the book and the second theme at the towards the end of the book. And we should be looking at those two now. So the first theme is idolatry. The people of Israel sinned against the Lord and began to serve the Baals. They stopped worshipping the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God who had brought them out of Egypt, and they began to worship other gods 
the gods of the people around them. They bowed down to them and made the Lord angry. In chapter 3, verse 11, the statement uh, is very much the same. And so it goes on, this theme going through. And there are two main reasons, as I've alluded to. First, quite simply, these pagan religions were fertility cults. They were attractive. Free sexual practices were said to encourage fertility in crops and animals. And secondly, the, the Israelites were moving from a nomadic existence to a settled farming existence. Living among the pagan neighbours uh, gave temptation. Temptation to forget their austere, invisible God, the visible, promiscuous ones. And they found so often their hard to resist and then as towards the end of judges we have this dissatisfaction with uh, the tribal league by chapter 17 the second theme occurs for the first time this man micah had his own place of worship he made some idols and an ephod and appointed one of his sons as his priest there was no king in israel at that time Everyone did whatever they wanted. There was no king in Israel at that time. Everybody did whatever they wanted. Things had got to a very messy stage. A reading judges, it seems to see that the league was not really working. Though lip service was paid to Yahweh as king, and when there was a strong leadership, such as Moses and Joshua in the past, Holding it all together, it worked. But when leadership was weak or disputed, things began to unravel. And as the people looked around at the kings around them, they, it seemed that they held things together better. And of course, that was an illusion. And we'll see that played out in the next books of the Old Testament. The book of Ruth uh, uh, is uh, from about the same time. The book of Ruth is only a few chapters long. It's easy to read and it's a beautiful, beautiful story of faithfulness and God's blessing on faithfulness. And out of that faithfulness, uh, Ruth had a son, Obed, who was the grandfather of King David. Faithfulness is blessed by God and can be used for his eternal purposes. And I think it also points very strongly to God's regard for women. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to say. Point us to Jesus. Well, look through and the New Testament makes little or no use of judges. It's a passing mention in Hebrews 11 where the writer lists people of faith, but nothing else that I can find. We can make a connection between Jesus as the perfect charismatic leader in a way that judges never were. But these connections will be made much more powerfully as we journey further through the Old Testament. Jesus also showed perfect obedience and is the just judge who will judge all people at the end of time. But he will do it justly. So in the next part, part six, we're going to explore people's demand for king and how that plays out. And we see uh, that in the books of first and second Samuel and the first book of Chronicles. Thank you.